Now let's look at how we should account for the investment in debt instrument. So remember, it is due uh, from the investor or buyer's point of view. In the previous sections that we've talked about, if I were to buy shares, of how we should account for it. But now, if I were to buy debt, of how we should account for it. But the question is why we should buy debt and where should I buy debt? Well, first, where should I buy debt? I mean, from the debt market. I mean, it's just to be the, uh, the debt market is like the stock exchange uh, where the company is the public listed company issuing shares. So at the same time, it can issue debt and it can buy its debt. No problem for that. Um, and um, second, why we should buy debt. I mean, in your investment portfolio, if you are managing an investment portfolio, uh, perhaps a lot of investors or companies will not risk their money in buying all the shares. But keeping, for example, 30% of their money into debt instruments or cash will really reduce the risk to a certain extent by keeping the remaining proportion of uh, the uh, money being the, uh, invested in the, in the shares uh, would really give you quite a uh, very good return from the portfolio. And that's why uh, a lot of investors or companies would like to keep a balance of shares at the same time debt. Um, and particularly if the economy is good, and of course the share price would increase, and giving you more yield on shares. But if the economy is not good, for example, go, it goes into recession, so perhaps the yield or the return from debt will be higher than that from the equity or shares. And that's why by keeping a balance between shares and debt instrument uh, would be a wise choice for many investors. And that's why a lot of companies or investors would buy debt. So this is commonly known as the investment in debt instrument. And if you take a look at your application on your, on your mobile, so for example, you download an application, and then you will see you can buy shares at the same time you can buy debt. So it could be the traditional debt, uh, like the normal uh, corporate bond, or perhaps the dip discount bond, or perhaps the, uh, I don't know, the, for example, the convertible bond. So uh, you can buy different bond, and this, one, this is what is known as the debt instruments that you can buy. Now, the accounting treatment for the investment in debt instrument will have to go through two particular tests. The test number one is called business model test. The business model test will simply be to test your business model. I mean, it's not testing your intention, but testing what you are actually doing, which means your business practice. So we are saying that the business model test is to test the transaction frequency. Whether you are trading frequently on the debt instrument or you're not trading quite frequently onto, onto, the, onto those debt instrument. Well, it could be divided into many circumstances. It could be not frequent to trade, which means uh, you buy the debt instrument and you want, you want to hold it to maturity. So throughout the period, for example, five-year bond, you'd like to receive interest 
at the same time receive redemption value back at the end of the fifth year. You are not trading this. So although you, the, the management may say, well, uh, if I need money, I want to resell it and to redeem the money back. But this is not your business model, this is your intention. The business model simply tests the frequency of your transaction, of how you deal with those debt instruments. And in this case, if it, it is not frequent to trade, if you look at your uh, transaction detail, we will see, okay, you're not frequently trading those debt instruments when you buy it and you're not selling it because, uh, for example, in the past, we can see your uh, debt instruments, well, uh, the debt instruments, number one, so that you invest it, you hold it uh, to, uh, to, to collect its redemption value, same to the debt instrument number two and number three and so on. So you pass the business model test to be not frequent to trade. The test number two. is to see whether that debt instrument consists solely in chests and principles. So in short, it's also known as the, it's called SPPI test. Well, in some cases, uh, that the test number two is not met, particularly if you're buying a convertible bond. So a convertible bond consists of interest, principal, but at the same time, an option to become a shareholder in a company. So if the answer is yes, which means your business model is not frequent to trade, which means uh, you're gonna hold the investment to maturity. At the same time, it only consists of interest and principal. And if that's the case then, you're gonna be using the amortized cost method to account for it. So amortized costs simply being your spreading the net gain over the remaining years of the debt instrument. That's it. Uh, from my perspective, the, the, the best way is to have a go at uh, an example of how we should uh, account for it. Okay. So as you can see, uh, a business invested uh, $10,000, the normal value is 5% coupon rate loan note in year number one. Okay, so you bought that $10,000 and 5% will be based on $10,000 to calculate the coupon interest to be received each and every year. It incurred transaction costs of $500 when the loan note was acquired, the loan note is simply be a debt instrument. You bought it. Okay, here's the thing. How to treat the transaction cost? Well, as I said in a previous section, that we can't see any PL stuff because it's for amortized cost method. And that's why the $500 needs to be capitalized, okay, uh, in the in the financial asset here, and that will be the financial asset investment in debt instrument. And we're told the loan note will be redeemed in three years time at the premium of 1255. Okay, so which means I bought the uh, loan note, I spent $10,000 here, but uh, at the end of the third year, I can receive 10,000 back at the same time, $1,255 as a premium. Okay, now, 
think about it this way. If you're using amortized costs, and that means it has to pass through these two tests, test number one, it's not frequent to trade, and in this case, we are not told that the business invested in the long note and then frequently trade it, which means resell it in the market. No, because it aims to collect interest and redemption value back. Well, for some uh, debt instrument, as you can see, the price may fluctuate quite a lot, especially for the convertible bond. And in this case, um, a lot of investors, when buying the convertible bond, may want to trade it or actually trade it as the price fluctuates. But here, it intends to hold it to maturity because as you can see as the example name, it's called advertised cost. I'm assuming that the long note would not be frequently traded. At the same time, it consists only for 5% of the coupon interest payment at the same time, the redemption value, as you can see, yes, you're right, the redemption value, we've got a premium on that, but uh, it's just to be the redemption value. And that's why it passes the test number two as well. It should account for it using amortized cost. And put it simply, what do I mean by amortized cost? You're gonna be see we're going to be seeing the net gain, yes, from a buyer's point of view, or the net loss or net cost from the issuer's point of view when we later on look at how we account for the financial liability using amortized cost method the idea will simply be the same but what do I mean by that then let's calculate the net gain by buying the uh, by buying the buying the bond like this first I have to invest $10,000, so let me just calculate that, okay, first I have to invest $10,000 and then we're told we incur $500 of the transaction cost which means we minus another 500 there and in each and every year I can get 5% on the $10,000 of the coupon interest if I were to take that 5% of 0.05 times by 10,000, and that would be $500 in each and every year. So I can receive $500 in three years. Okay. And these for the coupon in chest, I can receive. And this is for the transaction costs and this is for the amount invested at the end of the third year not only I can get ten thousand dollars back as the principal but at the same time I can also get the premium of 12.55 that's the premium so let's see the net gain how much I can get well it seems to me that I can cancel this with that because one is minus and one is plus this with that 500, so I can get $2,255. So the amortized cost method, which means we're going to spread the net gain over the, 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 the three year period. So, how can we do that? Using an amortized cost table, I'm sure that you've seen that in a previous section that we use the mnemonic called EC, effective interest and coupon interest. I mean the effective interest will simply be the internal rate of return. If I were to summarise all these cash flows all together and express it using a relative number. In this case, I prepared the Excel spreadsheet for you, but 
Please note that you are not required to do such things in your exam. If I were to put years at the year start, which means the year zero, we can see the cash flows consists of the monies that are paid of 10000 with $500 of the transaction cost, which means at the year start, I input $10,500 there. At the end of the year one, I can receive interest of 500 At the end of the year two, I can receive 500 interest. At the end of year three, not only I can receive $500 of interest, I can receive $10,000 as the principal coming back. At the same time, the premium of $12.55. So total them up would be $11.755. So these are the cash flows. And then calculate the IRR in the Excel spreadsheet. I can insert as the formula equals IRR and open the bracket and to select all these cash flows and you will see the IRR would therefore be 7%. I will explain why in a second. In this case, the effective interest is simply be the internal rate of return of these cash flows to be 7%. So let me explain how we should account for it. Well, first of all, when we buy it, we debit financial asset, and this is for amortized cost investment in equity, uh, in investment in debt instrument. If a total of ten thousand plus the transaction cost worth of 500 and that would be 10,500 with credit bank to reflect the fact that we spend the money in, into buying the debt instrument like that and uh, because we are using the amortized cost method and subsequently for a subsequent measurement, based on the uh, financial asset value worth of 10,500 using amortized cost method, we've got years, we've got the opening balance uh, of our financial asset, and then we've got E for effective interest. and C for coupon payment and then we got the closing balance. Now in the year number one we are told the opening balance is uh, 10,500. The effective interest which we just calculated is to be 7% uh, and we will test that whether or not the net gain would be equal to $2,255 later on. So if I were to take that 10,500 times by 7%, and that would be $735. And the coupon interest would just to be the same each and every, and every year at 5% on the $10,000, which means $500 subtracting each and every year. The closing balance for the financial asset would therefore be 10,735. We carry this forward in the year number two. The effective interest be times by 7%, so that would be 751. Subtracting $500, and that would be 10,986. We carry this forward in the year number three, times by 7% in there, 769. Subtracting 500. At the same time of the year, at the end of the year three, we receive $10,000 of the principal. We also receive the premium of 1,255. And therefore, the balance for the financial asset at the end of the year three would be zero. Okay. Since we've got these, if I were to total this 735, 51 and 69 all together, we can see a net gain 
is to be 2,255. It's just to be the same figure as we've seen here, and this is what I mean by amortized cost. We simply take the net gain and spread over three years. I mean, according to the life of the bond. Okay. And of course, you can say that why do we have that 2,255? In other words, the coupon payment to receive is only 5%, while the effective interest is 7%, because we are receiving 2% more. The 2% additional interest I can receive arises from, first of all, I can receive a premium of 1255 at the same time, netting off the effect of the original $500 of the transaction costs. So the net additional interest I can receive on top of the coupon interest of 5% will be 2%. Okay, so that's all we have to understand in the exam. Right then. How to account for it? Simple. The effective interest in each and every year, we simply debit financial assets at amortized costs of 735.5169 each and every year, and we credit the finance income in our PO. How about for a coupon payment? Coupon payment, we debit bank that we can receive the interest from another party. At the same time, we credit financial assets at amortized costs at $500, $500, and then finally, 500 plus 10,000 plus 1,255 each and every year. As you can see, we're using amortized cost table here to turn the original financial asset worth of 10,500 down to zero at the end of the year three by performing the accounting journals like that. Okay? And of course, you must understand when we are accounting for the finance income, and that just to be the income in each and every year. It's not accumulated balance. Unlike in the SFP or Statement of Financial Position, as we can see a financial asset bank, and this will be the accumulated balance that we need to bear in mind. In other words, the finance income recognised as 751 in the year number two will not affect the income of 735 in the year number one. Right. Okay, so that's how we account for it. So as you can see, and that's why we use IRR to calculate the effective interest. In other words, we are totaling all the cash flows all together. And it reflects the fact when we get cash flows in each and every year, it can be reinvested at 7% in the remaining years. And that's the meaning of the IRR. But here is just to be the total return, the net gains that you can get expressed in absolute number, and that will be 2,255, in relative number, and that will be 7%. I mean, in the past, when I teach the amortized costs, I often get asked by many students of how to arrive at 2,255 and what's the meaning of the amortized costs and so on and so forth. And even the finance manager working in a very large company has no idea about the uh, amortized cost method at all. But you must understand, this is just a method to spread the net gain over the life of the bond. To put it simply, we also need to account for the time value of money effect for those balances as well. And that's why we introduced the concept called effective interest. We need to account for the finance income worth of that. Okay, now let's see the second type of uh, investment in debt instrument. Let's see the test number one, the business model test. 
here, uh, a, a business buys that instrument, and it's quite frequent to trade, which means it's treating it like shares. If we see the fair value of the bond increases, okay, sell it immediately in the open market. Yes, this is quite normal for businesses to do that because businesses, for short-term trading purposes, we've got surplus cash uh, derived from these, uh, the cash flows forecasts. And then, yes, I'm going to plan how to use this investment or plan how to use uh, the money or the cash flows. For example, we've got the short-term surplus. Yes, I can buy the corporate bond in the open market. If the price goes up, immediately sell it and get the cash back. Okay, quite frequent to trade. Now let's see the test number two. I mean, irrespective of whether the investment consists solely of the interest and principal, because you're quite frequently to trade, you're going to put the fair value changes directly to the PO. Okay, so uh, I mean, if the answer for the solely payment of interest and principal, yes or no, in the second category, I mean, if the answer is no, yes, you're buying the convertible bond. Um, if that's the case, then, yes, I don't know, uh, I don't really care, because quite frequently to trade, that means you have to account for it as the fair value through PL, treating it as shares. You're taking the fair value changes directly into the PL and any transaction cost, as we've seen before, we're going to expense that as well. Okay. So the changes in fair value, put that into the PL. At the same time, the transaction cost incurred. In buying the debt instrument, we put that into the PL as well. Best way is to have a go at an example to see how it works. So let's see the uh, requirements number two here. Based on the previous example, if it is for fair value through PL investments in debt instrument, and also at the end of the year one and two, the value is twelve and eleven thousand dollars, and we've invested ten thousand dollars in buying the debt instrument of how we should account for it. So we uh, buy the investment, we debit financial asset worth of 10,000 and credit bank worth of 10,000 and for the transaction cost then of $500 because it's the fair value through PNO financial asset investment in debt instrument we debit PNO or transaction cost of 500 and we credit bank worth of $500 and now the value goes up to 12,000 which means from 10,000 up to 2,000 up by $2,000 we debit financial assets investments in debt instruments fair value through p and by 2,000 at the same time, we put that into the PNO or gain 2000. But now from 2000 down to 11,000, which means down by $1,000, we should debit PNO or loss of $1,000 and we credit financial asset investment in debt instruments with fair value through PNO worth of $1,000. 
a thousand dollars. So that's how we do it. Simple. Let's have a look at the final uh, situation. I'm going to use blue. I'm, I'm going to use red. Why not? Okay. To see the test number one. Uh, the test number one for the final category, we would say, well, uh, you're quite frequent to trade, really. But in some cases, they like to hold it as well. Hold it to maturity, which means it's, it is the mix of the first and second situation altogether. Well, this frequently happens if you've got if you manage an investment portfolio and you consistently investing your surplus cash into there and to buying, for example, different financial assets, for example, in, uh, the debt instrument. And for any debt instrument, you will see that the fair value fluctuates quite a lot because you are keeping a balance uh, between the higher risk debt instrument and lower risk debt instrument. For a lower risk debt instrument, uh, you would like to hold it to maturity, collecting cash, collecting interest and, 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 the, and the principal. However, for the uh, higher risk debt instrument, uh, if you see the price is quite good, you would like to sell it. And then sell it, and then you've got the cash, and you buy similar uh, debt instruments at low price, bringing back to your investment portfolio. And that's what I mean by frequency to trade and to hold, because you're keeping a balance in your investment portfolio, and then you're seeing, okay, for, for, for some part, lower risk, hold it, for higher risk, frequently trade it, something like that. Often seen in, when you're managing an investment portfolio. So if that's the case, okay, it's the business model, it seems that uh, you're managing investment portfolio, you frequently trade, at the same time you're holding it. That would not be the first and second category, and that would be the third category. And at the same time, you have to meet with the condition here, so the text number two, is it only consists of interest and principal payment. Instead of being any other options like convertibles. I mean, if the text number two is no, you will have to put the fair value changes directly into the PL in the second category. But if the answer is yes, yes, okay, uh, you are holding it, you're holding the investment portfolio, you will see some higher risk and lower risk debt instruments, some part of it for trading purposes, part of it for holding purposes to maturity. At the same time, it's quite straightforward because it only consists of interest and principal amount payment and if that's the case, and that would be the third category, and what you have to do is to designate the investment in debt instrument with the fair value through other comprehensive income or OCI. Okay, so that's quite important. As I said to you before in the original uh, section, when we've talked about the financial instrument. When we sold the investment in equity instrument, designated as the fair value through OCI investment in debt instrument, the accumulated OCI, we need to reclassify them into the PL rather than retain earnings to reflect the fact that the price of the bond may not fluctuate quite a lot as we've seen in when we are buying shares. And that's why for the investment in equity instruments, for example, uh, we would reclassify the previous reserve or OCI into retail earnings, but investments in debt instruments, we're going to be reclassify them into the PL directly. Okay, so that's how we deal with it. Right. Once we've understood that idea, the next thing is, because in the third category, we still got the element 
for example, to hold, similar to the first category. And that's why when we are accounting for the fair value through OCI, or the third category, later on, the accounting treatment will be a combination of the first and second category all together. So let's put them into a question. Just to be the same question as we've seen here, so in the first category, in the first instance, we are accounting for it using the cost method. So let's see in the example here. In the first requirement, we are told or we are asked the business may sell the loan note if the possibility with a high return arises and it qualifies as the fair value through OCI designation. Okay then. Now, if this is the case, we are also told the year one and year two, the fair value will be twelve and eleven thousand dollars. How should we account for it? As I said before, it, we will have to look at two components or uh, referring back to the first and second categories altogether. And that's how we do it. So first, we will copy that table and then keeping the EC unchanged. At the same time, we are changing the balance because, as we can see, we are using the amortized cost table, for example. The opening balance, again, is 10500 because uh, for the fair value for OCI, it's not P&L, and that's why the transaction cost of $500 needs to be capitalized with debit financial asset investments in, uh, investment in debt instrument fair value through OCI of $500 and credit bank $500 for the transaction cost. And accounting for the effective interest, accounting for the coupon payment, and we got the closing balance of $10,735. It should be updated to the fair value worth of $12,000. And then we carry the updated value of $12,000 forward and then we account for the effective interest, we account for the coupon payment, and we've got 12,251. And at the end of the year two, the fair value should be updated down to $11,000 and carry this forward, $11,000 there, and keeping things unchanged. Okay, so we've got the closing balance finally to be 100 uh, to be $14, we should update it at the end of the year 3, it becomes 0. So, from 14 down to 0. That's how we do it. The accounting journals for the effective interest will just be the same as what we've seen in the category number 1, so debit financial asset, credit finance income of 7.35.51.69, and then the coupon payments, accounting journals would be the same, when we are accounting for the third category, just to be the same as the first category with debit bank and credit financial asset, worth of 500, 500, and 500 plus 10,000, and then 1255 in each and every, and every year. But all we need to do then is to account for the changes in the fair value, as we can see, first in the first year, from 10. Uh, 735 to $12,000 by debiting financial assets and credit OCI by $1,265 And then for the year two, for example, from 12,251 down to 11,000.
So we debit OCI, 12.51, and then credit financial asset investment in debt instrument with the fair value free OCI, 12.51. And the year three, we calculated to be $14, and then down to zero. What we have to do is to debit OCI worth of 14, and we credit financial asset investments in debt instrument with the fair value through OCI down by $14. Okay. So that's how we uh, do it. Right, so when we sold the uh, investment in debt instrument, we calculate the profit or loss from the sale. At the same time, uh, we would be accounting for the uh, cumulative OCI. We're going to reclassify them into the p &L. Now, let's see. The final part in the investment in debt instrument, a little bit tough, I must admit, because I've introduced to you the three categories. Okay? The category number one, category number two, and category number three. Now, let me introduce to you the, the, the number four, or the special case. It's where we've got the irrevocable option. Again, to designate the financial asset from the amortized cost, which means the category number one. To fair value through PO to reduce accounting mismatch. Which means it's a very, very special case here. We're going to see, okay, the uh, financial asset, I mean the investment in debt instrument, as we can see in the business practice, it's not frequent to trade. At the same time, it includes the interest and redemption value or principal, in other words. In this case, it should be accounted for using amortized costs, which means we're going to spread the net gain over the years of the bond. But I've got an option here. It's the irrevocable option, which means we can't reverse it back. We're going to be seeing, okay, although it is accounted for under the amortized cost, but at the start, I would like to designate, I want to tell the financial asset, I would tell the accountant, we should account for the financial asset using the fair value through P&O. Okay, this normally happens when the party issues bond and then to get the money and then lend money to other customers for example issuing a bond it would create a financial liability and then we're going to sell those bond and lend the money to a customer another customer and uh, I mean, lending money to another customer, I would uh, c collect interest and the principal uh, back. Uh, but as you can see, the business or our business quite frequently issues bond, and the fair value of the bond will fluctuate quite a lot as my credit rating uh, changes. And this is why the financial liability, I would account for it uh, using the fair value method, which means the fair value through p and but at the same time, although I'm collecting the money from my customer uh, for the interest and the principal amount, but uh, here I would designate it from amortized cost to fair value 
through PNL as well, in order to match the fair value changes with my asset, with my liability. I mean, in the exam, you'll also see another case where the uh, business uh, has got, for example, investment property. I mean, issuing bond uh, to buy those property for investment purposes. I mean, investment property, according to the ICE number 40, accounted for using the fair value model. And in this case, I will also designate the financial liability at the fair value through p and rather than using the amortized cost or the traditional amortized cost method to match the fair value changes uh, with the liability corresponding with my asset to avoid accounting mismatch. Because, for example, if you're issuing bond and get the money and lend it to others, yes, lend it to others, you account for the effective interest by debiting the finance, financial asset and to credit the finance income, at the same time debiting bank and credit financial assets. But what if the fair value changes fluctuates quite a lot? Uh, as you can see, if the fair value fluctuates quite a lot, so for example, if a business credit rating is impaired, and it's likely that when it issues bond, it has to pay higher interest. And that's why when we are calculating the value of the financial liability, because of a higher interest reason, so the, the, the value of the financial liability will go up. But at the same time, we are charging uh, more interest uh, from others to compensate for the losses that I've made. And that's the reason why the value of the financial asset would also need to increase as well, which means the fair value of the financial asset for this company, because we are lending money to others, we are charging higher interests, and that's why the income I can get will be higher as well. The fair value of the asset will also increase. So here, if we are only accounting for the, for example, uh, financial liability uh, as the fair value through PNO, for example, uh, and in this case, we are only showing the huge losses in our PNO, uh, which does not correspond with the uh, increase in income in our PNO arising from the effective interest. And that's why we can designate the financial asset at the fair value through PNO, so, so we can correspondingly accounting for the increase in financial asset value in our PNO as the gain to the PNO as well. To match the gain from the financial assets in the PNO with the loss from the liability in our PNO to match them, to avoid accounting mismatch. And that's the reason why it is the irrevocable option for the business to designate the financial asset as, as the fair value through PNO investment in debt instrument from the amortized cost. But please do remember this has to be done at the start that we sign the contract. Okay? We cannot say, okay, first we've got the amortized cost investment in debt instrument. Subsequently, I'd like to change it. Uh, if you'd like to change it, and that's called the reclassification later on, and we will talk about the conditions that we have to meet with before we can do that. Hopefully, you will not find it very, very difficult for the investment in debt instrument. I hope you are absolutely happy with it. We've got three categories in there on the screen, okay, passing through the test number one, test number two into different categories. And of course, we've got a special case, which means an option for a business to do to avoid accounting mismatch. Okay, that's the end of this section, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye. APC, accounting for your future.